I think that we're live, guys. I'm Brian Schoening. We got Eric and we got our buddy Gary here. This is the Hunting Overtime Podcast. Welcome, everybody. Um, we are just, well, we just got done eating some awesome food. And that turkey was amazing. We, Life-changing. <laughs> that's not some <laughs> surprise. It was really good. A surpri- <laughs> is that a surprise because it was turkey, or is that a surprise because of who the chef was? Um, I would say because it was grilled. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the chef. <laughs> <laughs> Combination of a couple things, but it was, uh, it was no doubt good. <laughs> oh, man. It was really good. And then we added to So we had some... We had. It was like smoked, but it wasn't... It was like a grilled smoke on a pellet grill. So I did it at about... 300 degrees and soaked it in soy sauce and then we had dove poppers asparagus asparagus elk tenderloin, elk tenderloin. tenderloin. Um, those dove poppers were some of them had pineapple some of them had jalapenos we had beer and whiskey vodka Yes, sir. So it's been a pretty it's been a pretty good night. We were actually just talking that it's way past all of our bedtimes. It's currently ten twenty p.m., which is I don't know about you guys. I'm I'm at least an hour and a half past my bedtime right now. So yeah, hundred percent. But yeah, so we don't have anything specific here. We're going to talk about. We just kind of said we we're going to hang out tonight and we we're going to do a podcast eventually. And um, I guess we've been here for almost four hours and not got our podcast in, so we better get it in now. We decided. And, um, but yeah, the, so these two here actually, so Eric's a co-host here with me on hunting overtime podcast. As you guys know, Gary has actually just joined on with us as a, uh, collaborator for the seasons media. It's the so real he, deal now. Cause yeah. He's got a hat. Right. He's got yeah, a hat I, now. So official. that's big time. Like <laughs> we, I've been waiting for that hat for a long time. <laughs> if, if we give anybody a hat, that means you're in. So, um, <laughs> But yeah, we're actually both of these guys for the seasons media are going to do some content producing this next, this next fall and a little bit through the summer here, which is awesome. And we're excited to have both of you guys on board. We think it's going to be a, a, a good deal. And we're going to try to do some big things with it here this fall and see if we can't blow the seasons media up a little bit. And, Appreciate the opportunities. Yeah, so yeah absolutely. Be fun. Looking forward to it. Yeah, It's going to be exciting. Uh, lots of big things planned as we go throughout this and, yeah, Gary, I don't actually even know if I've told you about it. I'll have, to tell you. I'll have to wait until we get done with the podcast to reveal this because it hasn't actually been revealed yet, but we got some <laughs> other things we're working on um, that hopefully can help the season's media blow up a little bit. So Cool. Um, but the biggest thing that Eric and I have talked about that we've been excited to have Gary on for is he finally was able to go on a mountain lion hunt <laughs> And this one ended up being in Colorado, right? This was Colorado. Yep. And yep. Um, I'm going to let him kind of tell the story to us, and we'll pipe in with with some questions. We already kind of know the story, but yeah, our absolutely. listeners obviously don't. And I think everybody would be excited to hear about it because it's an opportunity that, honestly, not very many of us get. And for you to chase this thing with a bow, I think, is just that much more of a challenge and it makes the stories that, that much cooler. I know some of the guys I've talked to, sometimes it's hard, I think, to find outfitters who are okay with you going in with a bow. Absolutely. Did you find any of that? Uh, I was definitely in the minority, uh, for sure. Um, a lot of guys, you know, prefer, uh, prefer firearms in general, um, whether it be handgun, lever action. A lot of guys used to like, you know, like to take their, their lever action, their old antiques and stuff like that, um, kind of stuff of that nature. But yeah, um, archery hunters, it's not something they come ar- come across super often, I guess, so to speak. Was there ever was there ever a thought that you weren't going to do it with a bow, or was it like one hundred? Like the only way I'm going on this hunt is with my bow. Like that's it. I'm dead set. Yeah, hundred um, percent. If I wasn't gonna wasn't going to harvest it with a bow. I, in my mind, wasn't going to harvest it at all. Um, sometimes that's not the way it can play out. You know, worst case scenario, it, it is super rough country. Um, you're chasing one of the baddest predators on the planet 
in some of the, the worst country and the worst weather conditions. So, you know, there's a lot of things at play with that. Um, you know, it's, it's not out of the question for a guy to go down and, you know, potentially you have a bad fall and you might break every arrow in your quiver. And, um, you know, a lot of times you're going to be packing a sidearm. Um, I, I wasn't both of my guides, um, or my outfitters, they were, uh, so that was a, a backup plan. I'm not saying that's a great one because I'd have been better off throwing a rock at it than trying to shoot it out of a tree with a handgun. But, um, a long story short, yeah, in my mind, if I, if I couldn't harvest it with a bow, I, I really didn't have any interest in doing it at all. It's just my perspective on it. And it's, uh, not right, not wrong. Um, everybody's got their own way. It's just kind of the way I prefer to do it. I'm a bow hunter at heart, and that's the way I wanted to get it done. So, Awesome. Awesome. Eric, are you ever going to chase a mountain lion? I don't know. <laughs> it sounds a little crazy with a bow. I it, won't lie. It sounds sweet. I've, I've bought the Nebraska mountain lion tags yeah. for a handful of years, but for those, obviously you have to be a resident to get them. But you kind of got to make sure you you got to hit it, which I think might be with any mountain lion. I mean, you got to get it right. You got to hit it right. Hundred percent weather driven specifically. Yeah. A lot of times, and you got to yeah. you got to be able to cut that track. And yeah, because um, you can't use dogs. So that's yeah. There's one of the, the Nebraska season Nebraska. is a little bit different. There's times when you when you can't use dogs right away, but then later on you can. Um, but to be able to shoot one without a dog, like you better be able to cut a track, and you got to know where that cat's at. It's got to be fresh, and you've got to put some serious heat on it to get it up yeah. a tree. You know, yeah. it's it. Your odds, I would say, go down dramatically <laughs> without yeah. the dogs, but yeah. it can be done. Um, I know a couple guys that have done it, so it's blows my mind, but it is possible. And well, before I ask that question, why don't you tell us? Because this story doesn't just start with your trip to Colorado. No, like there, there's a whole bunch of backstory behind this and how this all came out, came about to be really, um, tell us some of that story. Yeah. Um, I probably won't get super in depth with it. Um, but this really did start three years ago. Um, I spent two years with a outfitter in Wyoming. Um, and I guess kind of to make a long story short with that, we were always behind the weather rather than in front of it, you know, as far as getting in, getting in front of a storm and, uh, you know, really getting out there in fresh powder and picking up fresh tracks. Um, unfortunately, the, like I said, to make a long story short, the dogs were subpar. The equipment was quite honestly terrible, not fit for the mountain at all. And I mean, in that rough country, I mean, you can't really afford to be working with anything but the best. In my opinion, um, if you want to have a successful hunt or a, you know a realistic chance, I mean it's just it's just rough country. Um, so yeah, to make a long story short, it just it didn't you know it just didn't add up for success. Um, yeah, it just wasn't headed in the positive direction. And <laughs> did you so you took trips out there to Wyoming? I did with so this outfit over the course of two years. I went three different times. Um, the first year we didn't. We didn't time it well, so the first year, I was the last client, so they had actually tagged out four clients ahead of me. Um, I was the last client in camp, so weather conditions were deteriorating. It was in February, March, early February, and spent five days out there after a snow, um, but just the overall temp starting to warm up, your southern slopes start melting off. Um, yeah, your conditions just deteriorate. And if you don't have great dogs that can run, you know, in snow and on dry ground, you're kind of up a creek unless you get a super, super hot track, which there again, we were always two or three days late. So, you know, we were running old tracks to begin with. So it's just hard for, you know, for subpar dogs. I mean, it was really impossible. You know, it just, it, it just wasn't a good scenario. I mean, we just weren't set up for success. Um, and that's kind of, you know, we followed into that second year and I made two separate trips up there again that year. And long story short, that just kind of, we were just behind the weather, the, the weather systems. I mean, we, you know, whether I, I would have rather, I have the, the flexibility to be there, you know, a day or two ahead of a system 
and wait for that snow to come which down. Which is huge. Like, not there's it's not everything. a lot of people that have that much flexibility. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, I can leave at the drop of a hat. Yeah. You know, that was the agreement. And yeah. I, you know, and and here we are getting there two or three days after the snow's down. And yeah, we're cutting tracks, but, you know, they're old. And there again, I hate to say it, but if you're working with subpar dogs, it's just not going to work out. Yeah. You know, and, and we did, I'm not going to lie, we did cut a couple tracks on cats that we could have caught, but. I mean, gosh, they, I mean, they were like an overgrown bobcat, you know, yeah. they they weren't anything. It, we were just, all we were going to do was go on a photo safari and waste the dog's energy. Cause it wasn't anything that, you know, potentially wanted to shoot. And I wasn't trophy hunting by any means. I just wanted a, a respectable, yeah. a respectable lion, you know, yeah. whether that be male, female, pr- preferably male, but, um, yeah, it's, you know, so we kind of d- you know, turn down those opportunities. And well, it's not something you want to waste your energy on either. Like, it's not just easy for you guys to take off and exactly. You know, they don't trek call, through this, to, the, yeah, these mountains. It's they don't not, call it a death march for no reason. No. I mean, it's, it's hard on the dogs. It's hard on you. It's, it's hard on everything. So, um, yeah, but that's kind of, that's where, um, where that experience ended in, in Wyoming. So we're obviously definitely not here to, like throw outfitters under the bus or anything. So we're not going to disclose who that was or anything like that. But so what made you, so just that culmination of things, um, subpar dogs, things like that. Um, a few years of just not getting it done. Is that what finally you were like, okay, well this isn't going to happen. We got to change something or did like, did the business is still there. They didn't shut down or anything. Right. They, it was just a decision you made or so at the at that current time yeah um i kind of came to the realization that if i was to ever harvest a lion with my bow i was probably going to have to go elsewhere to do it yeah um it after three years that's yes things were were not going in a positive direction and um yeah i just kind of came to that conclusion that if i was going to get it done that um i was going to have to go down a, a different avenue that's, so that's a hard choice you it had was to, you had to eat some dollars there I'm i sure. did i had to eat a, a fair amount of, of change you know that i had even tipped the guide and um and don't get me wrong i mean it's it's time and money i mean it all is yeah, i mean right. whether you're successful or not i mean hunting's hunting yep. but a lot of this unfortunately was kind of self-inflicted bad luck in my opinion but yeah, that's ultimately what, what led to, uh, my decision to look elsewhere and, and try and book through a different outfitter and, um, pursue it down a different was, avenue. So was there a reason you chose Colorado then instead of Wyoming or did it just happened to be what you found or were you like, okay, there's, there's no effing cats in Wyoming. Like, <laughs> well, what, what, <laughs> or were you just ready to try a different state? Cause Wyoming didn't work out for you. Cause I know people who killed mountain lions in wyoming so it's not like like i'm not saying wyoming is a bad state to go hunting and not to book with an outfitter in wyoming because i think there's a ton of people every year that kill cats in wyoming absolutely i know there is absolutely but was it just like a juju thing for you like you know so like a a tiny bit more to the backstory um i had actually been in touch with two different lion outfitters in wyoming before i had booked with this current outfitter that i was with so um long story short i'm gonna say uh i was kind of ready to move on and look elsewhere um and it came down to as a a summer day random i mean middle of gutter season i i'm a seamless gutter installer and i just doing some office work one day and thinking about that past experience and um, just thought, you know what? Like just refusing to give up on it. Like I, I, so side question, you bet. Is that what your office work looks like? Sometimes <laughs> the beauty of being, you know, it's, I, I get the distracted easily. <laughs> the beauty of being self. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The beauty of being self-employed. That is, let's accurate. see, let's do this invoice on, uh, Oh wait, actually, mountain way, lions on this mountain lion. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, some things you just don't get off your brain. <laughs> oh shoot! Uh, so, anyways, so that you're you were yeah, invoicing so, one day. Yeah, and so <laughs> I'm I'm doing book work in the office one day, and I'm thinking about this, and it's really eating at me, and you know, just sick about the way things ended up, and 
wondering if, if this is it, do I give up on this or do I keep pursuing it? Um, Cause I was out a substantial amount of money over those two years, tags, hotel room, you know, travel guide fees and all that stuff, tips. Um, and I randomly just got on Google and I typed in Colorado lion outfitters. And the first one that came up was Canyon rim outfitters. Um, Scott summer, uh, he's the guy that runs and operates it. Him and his son, Scott Jr. Um, yeah. And I, so I did some research, uh, read a bunch of testimonials, reviews, and read them quite frankly, until I was absolutely sick of them. And every single one, um, just talked about how great the dogs were, how great the, you know, the guides were the outfitters, you know, Scott Jr., Scott Sr., um, how great the equipment was. It was all top notch, you know, it was everything that, to be honest, I had been missing, um, in those past two years previously in Wyoming. So I thought, you know what, these guys are, they're worth giving a call to. So, um, I did, uh, I'm just looking to see if you made their photo gallery. Uh, probably not on their website. He hasn't updated that in quite some time. (laughs) No need to when you have cats like this on there. Yeah, There's... if you if you look at the, if you're in the market for a lion or a bobcat, um, Canyon Rim Outfitters out of Silk, Colorado. These these guys are your guys. They are a absolute blast to hunt with. And um, I'll be quite honest with you, and I'm not just saying this because of my experience with them. Um, they they truly are the best at what they do, and they specialize in lions and bobcats. Period. They don't do anything else. Um, that is all they do um, throughout those winter months. That's kind of important too, because you got guys that are they know what they're they know what they're looking for. They're not bouncing from deer to elk to mountain lion in the winter. They're like, not trying to supplement yeah. the outfitting business. Yeah, yep. like they're they're doing what they're good at. They know what they're good at, and they're specializing in it, and that's important. And so, for those of you listening and watching, I'm just checking their website out here. It looks like it's a uh, 8500 for a mountain lion hunt and 2500 for a bobcat hunt. And you so, can do the combos. Um, you cannot do a... Now, this may change. You might have to read the fine print. As of what I know from when I was up there last year, um, the bobcat is more of a bonus. You cannot book just a bobcat hunt. Oh, you, you might get not that be able with the bonus that. of a lion. Yep. yep. I wonder if it says anything here. Which... I can kind of get more into that, you know, as our, as our story progresses here, cause we had another guy in camp that was after a bobcat. So gotcha. Yeah. It doesn't say that here, but who knows? Um, but yeah, if anybody's looking to do a mountain lion hunt might be a route like what you're looking for, especially for, I don't know, maybe you can find it for cheaper at a different, different outfitter, but I mean, you can probably you, you can absolutely pretty much vouch for these guys that oh you absolutely can get it for for cheaper. Um, but I this is definitely everybody's always heard that saying. You know, you get what you pay for. Yeah. Well, this is it one hundred percent. And that that really seems to be true in the hunting interest industry, like absolutely. the outdoor industry. Like if if you go cheap on something, you're probably gonna get cut a little short. Yep, like no doubt. At some point, yeah, or at least at least don't have the same expectations, right? Yep. Like don't don't book a a cheap whitetail hunt and think you're going to shoot a 180 class whitetail. Like Absolutely. it's just ain't going to happen. Yeah. So same thing. I that same thing would go for a mountain lion hunt. Don't don't book a cheap mountain lion hunt and think you're going to shoot this big old tom. Yep. So absolutely, absolutely. So how about so like lodging? So when you went. This is kind of a crazy story because we had a huge blizzard hit Mm -hmm. about the time that you went. (laughs) And by huge blizzard, I mean like a week out of school blizzard. Yeah, one of the bigger ones Western Nebraska has seen in a while. (laughs) 70 mile an hour winds, feet of snow, like the town was shut down for three or four days. Like they, like the snow plows didn't even run for Pete's sake. Like just crazy, like blizzard. And schools were shut down for the week but you made it out of town before that hit right we made it out the day before we actually got do you guys need a drink you need a beer um i might grab a beer yeah i'll go i'll go grab you one beer you want i'll take one okay you want anything else 
I'm drinking the west rest of my wife's white claw. <laughs> I poured it in a glass so it looks more classy. <laughs> you keep telling the story. I already know the story. You keep talking. Okay. I'll go grab you guys some beers. Um. So yeah, we. So this all kind of started. So I was booked for like the the 19th of December, and uh, what had happened is it was probably roughly. Yeah, it was, I think it was about the 11th or 12th of December. We were up here in Sydney for my sister's birthday party, um, having some chimichangas. It's kind of her favorite favorite dish. But uh, anyways, uh, Scott Sr. calls me and says, hey, he says, can you get out of town in the next couple days? He said, we got a big front coming in, and they had just tagged out back-to-back clients on the first day. So they were running ahead of schedule, had this – great front coming through is supposed to drop about six inches of fresh powder and um yeah anyways it was shaping up to be perfect conditions so he says if you can get here within the next two days try to get here so my wife had originally taken off days to be gone like the 19th through the 23rd so we had some finagling to do with her schedule but I'm fortunate enough that I can leave the drop of a hat with my schedule and what I've got going on that time of year. Um, so we got things worked out. We got out of town. I think it was on a Monday or Tuesday night. And like I said, that storm was rolling in behind us. And I think it was, I can't remember a hundred percent. Maybe. Oh, push. <laughs> I don't know if it's Edwards, Colorado. I, we were probably maybe an hour from Silk, Colorado is where we were at and got nearly in a fender bender weather conditions went to hell in one heck of a hurry. (laughs) So we actually had to get a hotel and stay, um, stay that night and finish the rest of the drive into Silk, Colorado, um, that next morning. Um, but yeah, once we had got into town that next morning, uh, I had talked with, uh, Scott and the plan was to pick me up at two o'clock in the a.m. that next morning and and begin that hunt. So I'm gonna crack this wish light here real quick. You better do that. (laughs) Um, yeah. So that, like you said, that blizzard hit. That's good, isn't it? It is. It's (laughs) tasty. I like it. (laughs) Um, but you made it. We did. And we finally made it. Yeah, it was a little bit of an obstacle, but but we made it. But did that's that typical. Delay you from like what the guide was expecting, like they wanted you there to be ready to go at a certain time, or did you? Were you still able to make? No, we actually made it in perfect time. Um, so even though we ran into some slick spots up there in the mountains getting to silt, um, we actually weren't still planning on hunting we were a day ahead of schedule which was great and we actually had another system move in on top of us that night so he was going to pick me up at two in the a.m to go out and cut tracks well we had a system still sitting on a snow and which made that challenging obviously but we we timed it just absolutely perfect which was nice you know after two years of being two or three days behind the system yeah we were there in it so we were there I mean, as soon as, as soon as it's going to get done snowing, I mean, which, which is exactly when you want to be there. Like It is. But even like Scott said, he says, you know, it's going to be the day after because that snow is going to have the game kind of pinned down. You know, sure. they're going to be Makes laid sense. up. So the cats aren't going to be out moving either. Um, so generally he says, I'd be surprised if we kill today, if yeah. we find one to run. But um, he said tomorrow for sure. But we were lucky enough that, that we did cut a track fresh enough to run later that morning. So, so how, what was his strategy? Um, I guess with like cutting the tracks, were you guys on sleds? What were you, were you? So to start this, so I was with Scott senior and then we, we had another client in town. Um, the kid, his name was Yanzi. Um, he, uh, he was there, he was the previous client that had shot his line and he was there trying to follow up and finish with the Bobcat. Okay. So he was with Scott Jr. So we both took different two tracks, different county roads. Um, so they were out same time we were, 2 a.m. in the morning, just on a different different part of the mountain, um, cutting tracks and it was snowing like crazy. Um, <laughs> so not great, you know, 
but it was nice to be there in the moment when you knew you were going to be working with fresh powder, but sure. it was, it was coming down fast and, you know, it was really covering things up as fast as one could have made it arguably, but we were on, uh, in duly pickups at that point in time and what they were running. Um, so we were on the County roads, obviously with the duallys, but, uh, when we'd get off and run the two tracks, they had, uh, can-am four-wheelers with two okay. seaters is what they were so really nice comfortable so that's what we did all the with riding. regular tires so these are regular tires yeah they were jacked up and had oversized tires on them but at that point so we were mid-december with the snowfall that they had had they were really knocking on the door getting close to switching over to tracks um so we were kind of right at that transition point um within running tracks on the on the quads okay um and then you know when it gets worse from there they do have snow machines and then they've got a tracked up um side by side can-am these guys are they can get anywhere they need to be that's what i guess pretty impressive i guess i always imagined like i get maybe it's just in my mind but i imagined that hunt i guess being on sleds and yep. riding in and cutting tracks and yep and you do a lot of times i mean we did that in wyoming um typically right now i think a lot of lion outfitters are running tracked up side by sides just because they can get the dog boxes in the back sure. they can get the guide the client yeah um, makes sense and a lot of guys like to run and those you know, tracks can get you damn near anywhere it's insane like it's crazy yeah absolutely insane what you can go over <laughs> yeah. you know you just don't sink i mean the, it yeah, there's there's no shortage of the places you can't yep. go with those tracks. Yep. So, pretty impressive. So you're running around. You cut you cut your cut your track. So what? we were we did not cut the track. Um, senior and I did not cut the track. Okay. We actually got a call from Scott Junior. and said, "Hey, I got a track." He sent us some. Uh, I guess he snapped a couple pictures of it in the snow and the headlights because he had cut that track. It probably. 3 30 or 4 in the a.m so it was still dark and sure. it had snowed in probably two inches already wow um yeah so we didn't know how big i mean he blew it out um it, and honestly it just came down to you got to turn the dogs out on it because they said well it could be a could be a big female could be a small male we just aren't going to know unless we run it and catch it and we don't even know if um you know if it's fresh enough based off of the powder in the snow that it was in. So that was the problem with the snow is the snow that we had got was so dry, um, which is not great for the dogs and their noses sure. um, to yeah. pick up. Makes sense. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, junior found that track, like I said, three thirty four in the morning and we continued running a bunch of two tracks and other roads and come daylight. Um, cause you can't turn out in the dark. You can't on bobcats, but not on lions. So, uh, we just decided if we didn't find a better option by daylight, we'd go all of us back up in there, turn the dogs out on and see what, see what it would do. So, and that was the first, so was that the first track that you actually came across is when you got to that? Yes, that was so you and you were with senior. You said, yes, you didn't cut anything. You didn't find a track or you, not, they were just little, not anything or not you fresh say or 100%. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you'd be surprised how similar, a big lion track and an elk track looks in the snow. Yeah. You know, I, very similar, especially when they've been snowed in. Well, That's what I'm like saying, in, when they're snowed in. Like a dry in. snow or where... Exactly. Like, we all know how what that looks like, even like here. Like, you get a dry snow in it, you step in and it just covers. Like, yep. you can't... Exactly. You can't tell what Tough the heck it tell. is. You know, something was there. You don't know if it was a rabbit or a deer. Yep. 100%. I mean, you got to be a damn good tracker to... Yeah. Yeah, decide well, some of that stuff. Unfortunately, that's not me. So nor myself. I uh, <laughs> I can't even hardly track them when they're when I've put an arrow through them, let alone <laughs> let alone before they're still alive. Like, <laughs> um. So, anyways, then you so you got there. That was a track you ended up pursuing. How? Well, first of all, I if I remember right, I seen some of the pictures. You had these. It must have been cold. Was it cold? I, you know, didn't you have big terrible. old boots on? Didn't you? Yeah, and that's the thing. Like is that those, just because you're riding so the much? The layering or? process for that is crazy. You've got to be dressed for like sub zero temps just because of yeah the riding, the amount of time you're going to spend on that quad. It's not that the temps are so cold, but 
if anybody's ever been out there riding around on a four-wheeler motorcycles, you know, sled side by side. It can be in 30 elements, degrees. And it can feel like 30 below. Yeah. So you got to be able, you got to dress. So what I actually wore, which was crazy, and it was the best thing I ever did. I wore all my ice fishing gear. <laughs> yeah, my ice fishing gear, you know, it's I, striker ice. That's I have a striker ice suit, and that's what I wore 100%. And my boots um, were just like an 800-gram thin slate um, is what they were, just an overall mountain hiking boot um, with some good socks. But uh, other than that, yeah, that's that's what, what I wore. And then as soon as you dump those dogs and, you know, you, you're really the chase is on just stuff you can strip out of really quick and yeah. cuz you're down to your base layer cuz you're going to get hot on that death march in, you know. It's going to get warm. Eric doesn't know a whole lot about that because Eric walks 200 yards to his tree stand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Eric, Eric <laughs> loads his warm clothes up in his camper and step outside. He's got it figured <laughs> out. 200 yards to the tree stand. <laughs> See a 180. I wish. Live in the dream. It's not quite that much of a dream okay it's a 115 same thing though let's be honest <laughs> did it taste the same on the grill yep. dang right actually the 115 would have tasted better guarantee it wouldn't have been as cool though. <laughs> wouldn't, have, <laughs> wouldn't have been as cool you got it's all it's all for the gram <laughs> it's all about what pictures you can take that's right and, but when you hang them on the wall you guys got better trophy walls than i do it's kind of depressing. They're always a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, you you get your stuff shed off and you guys just take after. So like how did you release the dogs first? Did you? Yeah. Like so how's, how's that look? Like just because you saw the track doesn't mean the little cat's there. And it had been there for a while. Like yeah. you know that track had been there for a while, especially at this point. We were thinking probably... Which was still pretty fresh. I mean, nine to twelve hours, which was kind of their guesstimate on it. But we just had so much heavy snow on top of it that it was just really hard to tell if the dogs would take to it or not. Um, and like Senior said, he said, you know, there's only one way to find out. We ain't gonna know if we can catch it unless we turn the dogs out and let them run it and see what they do. Yeah, makes so, sense. so we obviously went in there at daylight, um, blew the track out. They kind of looked at it, and as I just said a little bit ago, you know, they didn't said it could be a small male could be a big female oh, only way you're going to find out is put it up a tree so um, we turned the dogs out on it and they probably made it i'd suppose maybe 400 yards and they got all sorts of turned around i mean you can watch them lining out on the on the gps not lined out but you know you could tell they were working the track and then what's he have what's he running for G? like does he have a tablet thing that he's watching or he what does that have look a like tablet no he like, just how do you had see like a, a typical kind of a gps like a garmin, garmin like gps like a garmin, yep, with that just happened to have the trackers yep. connected to it so and... you got every dog on there and and the color corresponds so you know well actually i think they even had i think it even had names so he knew dog. which dog it was yep and... so we knew and we were running at that point in time if i remember correctly we had three veteran dogs and three rookies that were kind of in training is what we were running. Um, something of that nature. I, we had either six or seven. I can't remember exactly right at this moment. It might've been seven, but uh, yeah. So we had some lead dogs that were, you know, definitely equipped for the job and well rested because they had just got off of, you know, a previous, you know, that was probably two or three days prior um, had treed that line for that, the kid that was still in camp with yeah. us. So Yanzi, he was still there trying to kill a bobcat. And just so happens, <laughs> the dogs get turned around after we um, had turned them out on this lion. That's what they got turned around on was a fresh oh, bobcat okay. track. So they were spinning circles and just, they got all jacked up. So um, Senior had to walk back in there and get them lined out again, get that lead dog kind of headed down that, that lion track again. Um, what kind, of, well. what kind of dogs are these? These are plot hounds, P L O T T, huh. okay. and they are incredible. They are the coolest. I mean, I don't know. It's just for hounds, man. They are so neat, and I don't know a lot about them. I don't really don't know anything I, about I, hounds I, in yeah. general. I honestly never never heard of a plot. I mean, they are vicious, 
at the same time, they would be the best house dog, best huh. friend you ever had in your That's life. Crazy. I mean, they can just flip a switch, but they are, they are hunters, boy, and they they just live for it. So, uh, think Carbon could do that. Uh, I need a little <laughs> bit of training. Might need We're working on not peeing inside <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> uh oh, hadn't, no, hadn't heard that story yet. <laughs> <laughs> Decided the indoors was bathroom time, huh? Yep. <laughs> oh man, yeah, not ready for cats yet. <laughs> Definitely not ready for cats yet. Hmm. So they get turned around. Senior gets them back on track. Yep. Um, and then, oh gosh, really, it was it was kind of a slow go. It was a grind. They did get turned around again one other time, um, but they were able to kind of line themselves back out. So this all took place. We, I believe, I think we turned those dogs out at roughly, it was probably close to seven that morning. Um, and they had traveled nine miles by the time they Jeez. got that cat treed. My goodness. Yeah, they had run him nine miles. And they'd only got turned around one other time um, other than that bobcat to start. But they were, like I said, we didn't have to go in there and line them out again. They were able to kind of line themselves back out. But it was really fun to watch them on that GPS collar um, as it got closer to the end. They it's a straight line. I mean, you could see them just straight line and you could see them zigzagging the rest of the time. So you could tell that they were maybe on to it as they were on the chase. You could tell that it, you know, it's on man. It's, it's going. And we lost them down in this big Canyon, uh, lost signal. So we had to go all the way around, get out, uh, get out a different antenna so we could try to pick up signal. And the next time we did that, they were all showing treed up in this Canyon. So how, how can you tell that on a GPS just on that, that they're all in the same spot? So they what? have a device within that collar that when those dogs are up on that tree, it's like a, a leveling device. Oh, like an angle because they'll actually get their paws up yes. on the tree. And it's showing in that GPS is popping off all treat, all treat, like all the dogs are up a tree and all like just a cluster, you wow. know? So yeah. Yeah. And which was just crazy you know i just couldn't believe that. at which case what is going through your mind now oh like, disbelief. like like you you know they're on a <laughs> you know they're on a track like this whole time you know like you said like you said they're they start going like kind of a straight line so you got a pretty good idea they're like they're on this thing you but, do? but then you go and re get a new signal and when you pull the signal up they've but, yep, they when, showed tree get there and pull up that news and finally get signal with them again get reception i mean it's they're treed and i'm so is that when you start doing like what i like when a buck's coming in for me and i'm just like that's what i was just gonna ask so are you shaking you yet? know or did it was or, it or was it just closer? so surreal and you just like had to go and you were just busy and you had so much to do like i couldn't allow myself to really get to that yeah. place i guess just because of my prior i'm gonna say trauma mm. you know <laughs> like like this uh, is actually happening in, exactly until i see this lion in a tree i'm not gonna believe that it's even there it's you've had too many false alarms it was yeah there's just Boy so who cried many wolf. ups and downs yeah. that i just couldn't allow myself mentally and emotionally to go there um i wanted to <laughs> but i thought it just it can't be it can't be you know because it i mean they were working that track good but they it wasn't anything like and you're you're kind of reading your your outfitter too yeah and yeah. to me like i wasn't getting the vibe from them yeah. that like man this is hot we're on it like we're gonna we're gonna get this cat on this other note though this was funny as we're driving in that morning at like seven o'clock to go up there and check this track out we see a bald eagle on a tree scott looks over at me says we're killing a lion today all says, right really he says Oh, anytime you see an eagle, he says, you're going to kill a lion. He says, it, every time. And well, good to know, but you ain't had me before, you know. I've <laughs> yeah. two years without maybe, it. Maybe, seen every maybe I'm the imagine. bad luck charm. Like he maybe. kind of likes the cursed clients. I'm not the first <laughs> one he's had, and he'll tell you stories for days about this. But um, no, uh, yeah, it's so, you know, super, super excited, but yet still in disbelief. So we uh, get off the four wheelers. 
Um, and Scott's, yeah, man, they're treed. They're out there. We got to go. And that's when, you know, you hear, if you've ever heard um, people say, you know, you talk about a death march within lion hunting. Yeah. Um, it's. We like, we talk about it. Heck, we talk about elk hunting. Like, there's certain same things kind we, of thing. we yep. go on death marches. I think that's what we do. Yep. Um, within lion hunting, it's, you know, the, the fear and the concern is you don't know what kind of, you know, what kind of tree that lion is in or if yeah. he's, you know, you can kind of tell off the topography, topography, you know, from your GPSs and stuff of that nature, um, what kind of country it's in, if it's in rocky stuff or not. Um, but the, the concern is to get up there and get the dogs. Um, it's for their safety, 100%. Yeah. You know, get them out of the tree if they happen to be in it or if they've got one bait up in the cliffs, which is super dangerous, which houndsmen it's the sure. worst case scenario, you know, yeah, if they got in, something in a the cave or something where, yeah. like that, you know, that's when dogs get, get hurt or killed. And, um, yeah, so that's kind of, then the death march began and we were super, super fortunate because, um, we had, you know, the dogs put nine miles into this chase and we went right at three quarters of a mile is what it was up this drainage. And, so that was when when you got out, you went, I was going to ask that question, yep. how far you had, you yep. went three quarters of a mile. Yeah, we had about three quarters of a mile up that, up that bottom to get up there to it. So like, I'm not real good with percent grades, but like mm-hmm. steep stuff or not like, crazy, not gradual. crazy, gra- pretty gradual. gradual. Yeah. yeah, I would say gradual and you know, total elevation. I think we ended up shooting that cat at not terribly high, or at least not terribly high to me. I think. 78 or 7900 oh, something bad. like yeah. that so it, it wasn't terrible okay. at all um you know definitely a game changer for a flatlander like myself but um yeah it was uh it was a march up in there though i mean you, you're talking you get about 12 inches of snow on the ground between the old stuff and the new stuff and and you got to be trucking i imagine like it, as fast as you can go safely yeah <laughs> yeah if you want to call it safely <laughs> It, uh, there's, I spent more times on my, more time on my hands and knees than I did on my feet crawling through that stuff. <laughs> and crazy. I had a pack on, had my bow, um, and quiver and everything strapped to my back. Cause I knew I would want my hands free. Um, it's just, it's nasty country. It's terrible, you know, and you're going faster than you probably should. And you got that much snow on the ground. You can't see where you're going and what's underneath you. And yep. it's, it's a little sketchy, but it's part of lion hunting. So. Well, and that's, we found many times hunting, like I can think of the, the time we were chasing that bull elk in the canyon this year uh, with my brother. And when you get on something like that, though, like you don't think about it. Like it just no. happens. And then all yep. of a sudden you're like you four just miles from the go. truck from where you start. You're four you're like, miles from the truck and you've changed a thousand feet elevation or whatever it is in this yep. case. Like you just go like you don't really think about it there's just something about when you know there there's an animal there and that that's your target animal like there's there's a whole nother level of i guess stamina and how in shape you are and you know like you might not be in shape whatever it is but i don't know about you guys but when i when i'm like that thing and i've never done it with a lion but i've been able to be like that bull is bugling over there and I'm going over there, like yep. or that when we were just turkey hunting, that turkey was gobbling over there. We're and, going over, and there. we crossed four yep. canyons, and we got over there. Yep, like you just do it. Um, so I guess that adrenaline. When you have the adrenaline point. and the drive, and like that three quarters of a mile, I imagine probably went pretty quick for you. It did. It went by in like the blink of an eye. Yeah, yeah. It just went super quick, and I was. Just thanking God the entire time I was keeping up with the outfitters because those guys can literally sprint up well, mountains. They live there. They do. Like, I mean, they they're are acclimated to it, and they spend an obscene amount of time in that country. Yeah. And I mean, they can literally walk away from you. So all I wanted to do was just stay close. And the fact that I could stay with them, you know, within twenty yards, I was tickled to death. Yeah. I didn't want to be the last one to the party. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. But. Yeah. So, you went your three quarters of a mile. You get there. Dogs are good? Dogs were good. Yep. That lion went up. Probably couldn't have been a better tree. All the dogs were in great shape. Um, there is a little side note to that. One of them, we don't really know what happened to him. He, uh, Rowdy was his name. He, for some reason 
left and backtracked all the way back to where we dropped them. We had to, after this was all over, said, and done with, we had to go drop the lion and go all the way back up to where we dropped the dogs originally wow. and get this dog back. We don't know if he was in the lead and got into it with that lion. I mean, he was unscathed, unhurt, but he come back with his tail between his legs, and he was obviously, I mean, whipped hmm. physically. I mean, he something was... Something changed his direction. Something turned him back, and he followed that set... Followed, he followed it exactly. We looked at it on the GPS. Peculiar deal. But he followed it all the way back to where we dropped him. Wow. For some un- and he was one of the rookies. This was not one of the veterans. But, um, yeah, odd odd deal for sure. But we ended up getting the dog back, yeah. and he was 100%. Oh, that's good. So. That's really good. So the cat cat's in the tree. Best tree that maybe you could have had one go up. 100%. Yep. How st- still nothing like... <laughs> you know, I I pretty well kind of have kept ice her under, in my veins. That, I, that's I do, impressive. That's I impressive. Do pretty well with it, considering you know what it all transpired leading up to that moment. Um, I I'm a pretty calm, cool individual until afterwards, and I oh, even the, you're the after guy. I'm, I can relate a little bit to, to a, that. To a point, yeah. I I kept it pretty well all in check with this throughout you know start to finish but um yeah it so I, once you get there how like what's your process what i would say that 95 plus percent of people listening to this have never and may never go on a cat hunt mm-hmm. so what's your process once you get up on this cat tree dogs are here like you walk up dogs are up the tree I imagine barking like crazy. Crazy. Yeah, just going loud. nuts in these woods, right? It's in kind of an intense and environment. <laughs> cats up there. Yep. What do you what do you do? What does the outfitter do? What's what's that look like? I So once we get there to the tree, kind of assess the situation, um, the outfitters they start leashing up their dogs, tying them off the trees. So they just walk up to them. Yep. Leash them. Yep. Take them to a different tree. Pull them out of the way. Yep. So we were, this embankment or the side of this mountain that we were on was super steep. And I mean super steep. You did not walk up it. I crawled up it on my hands and knees. And so did they. I mean, it was, it was super steep. So we took all the dogs uphill, knowing that when you shoot the lion, generally he's He's going to want to go downhill. Yep. (laughs) Sure. Exactly. So, um, yeah, when you get there... You uh, we get all the dogs tied up, get them, you know, kind of at a safe distance and then start looking for your shot. You know, what's going to give you the so best. So you're just window. walking like around the tree, just kind trying to find the best. It, kind of side hilling it on that uphill side. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously some of your shots can be pretty steep, but this was so steep that we could go uphill enough to where it was literally be about almost shooting parallel with it. That's it, nice. It that's was. an, it, that's a huge advantage too, because that was one of the things I've always wondered about is you got to know your angles a little bit. Cause 100%. you're, you're right under the tree at 10 yards shooting up. Like you better not shoot your 20 yard pin. It changes like, everything. Like you better shoot your 40. If somebody like, tells you different, don't believe them. Yeah. I uh, in preparation for this, I've got a, old school tv antenna in my backyard and i hoisted a target up there and i shot everything from being literally two yards from the bottom of that tower out to 10 yards and until you get to 10 yards out roughly you are not shooting your 20 yards oh you better shooting under that yeah you better not be 40 50 60 it's crazy so i actually built a cheat sheet so i knew based off of what scenario i got into trust your rangefinder yeah because <laughs> it's got you know if you're shooting a good range finder with ang- angle compensation yeah trust it and when, if you don't you're gonna end up when it says four day. yards it's four yards like <laughs> yeah yeah and know how that corresponds to your your, your cheat tape do you remember any of those off the top of your head like that's kind of putting you on the spot a little bit and, oh my gosh but like what are your what are I, your ranges i just know jeez man Generally, I would. Um, trying to think now. This has been a minute. <laughs> I still got the cheat sheet in my bino harness. Um, I know that, like, when my rangefinder was reading like two yards, when I was directly below, um, 
below the tower. So essentially, if I was right below the cat, I want to say it was roughly shooting him for like 40 or 45 yards. That's what I've always, gap would be. when I've out, when I've always, I've never shot up. I've always been down. Mm-hmm. Okay. But when I've shot in 3D tournaments and stuff, shooting down at like two yards, I've always shot my 40 yard pin. Yep. Yeah. If you ever spend any time paper tuning, if you spend a lot of time paper tuning your bows and stuff, yeah. if you're shooting at like six yards, you're going to shoot roughly like generally your 50 or 60 yard pin if you're shooting at like six feet sorry yeah six, six feet, feet from yeah. the paper you go back to like 20 feet you're gonna be more like shooting your 30 yard pin yeah you know it's so that's kind of can help you yeah kind of gauge that a lot of people don't necessarily think about that like because your whole site is lined up that the longer distance is at the bottom and the shorter distance is at top but the whole catch is and you guys know this but for the listeners and viewers as you're shooting that bow, like it, your sights here, your arrows down here. Yep. At some point, they got to cross. Yep. yep. Exactly. It actually cost me a deer. That's how I learned it. Because when I was like 15, I had a deer freeze right under me, like 150 incher, and I didn't know where to shoot it for. Yeah. Yeah. Whiffed right under me. Yeah. Yep. Should have shot it for 40. Because I had no idea. Yeah, and that's yep. what's crazy about it is, and people don't think about it, but it's all, it's all your. I mean, if you want to call it geometry or physics or whatever you want to call it, like it's a combination of all of that, I suppose. But yeah, at some point that arrow has to cross your sight and that's where your pins line up is because your arrow arcs up and crosses that sight line. Well, until it starts changing direction a little bit, like it, when it's going up, you got to shoot it for further. Yep. Just how it is. But mm-hmm. it's a crazy, it's kind of a crazy concept that if you don't know much about it, you don't necessarily think about it. You can make exactly that mistake that you're talking about, Eric. Yeah. And you can whiff on something because you're you in spend your. spend all your time practicing at 20. And then yeah. all of a sudden the deer's under you. And I just remember thinking, yeah. um, I'm probably going to screw this up. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd be on, like, I, I'll, I'm going to shoot my 20 yard pin probably to 10 yards or so. And, but at ten yards, you're, you're not hold. you're not going to be dead on. Yeah. Yep. And after that, especially, you better start compensating low. Yep. Low in your sight housing. That is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So when you got up to the treed cat, did the guides know right away that it was a shooter? Or yeah, when we got close, were they like Junior was the first one there, and then it was Senior, and then myself. But yeah, when when Junior gets up there and finally could get it. A glimpse of him up in the tree he's he looks like, back and he's shooting. got this big grin on his face you know he's like man thumbs up he's like, it's a good one <laughs> you know i'm thinking well that's fantastic it, if it's a cat in the tree i'm gonna be tickled i don't care how big it is uh-huh. i mean after what i've been through and i did they know who, your whole backstory like oh you yeah told, yeah yeah and i mean i did not I didn't throw anybody under the bus as far as my Wyoming yeah. situation. No names were mentioned. Um, but, yeah, they did know of, of the struggles, I yeah. guess, and what I'd been through yeah. leading up to that. And they've had several of those. Yeah. They really have. And, it's, you know, Senior, he's a unique individual. And, you know, he's just, he, a lot of guys think he's God, which you would. <laughs> hell, I do. <laughs> yeah. If there's a lion hunting God, it's him. It's, that's, it's Scott that's Summers. That's guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's funny. Well, so, I – I mean, I I think it's cool kind of the way you handle it, too, because you know, and it's something that we both know, and my brother, part of the season's media, like, we know it, like, hunting is hunting. Like, yeah, you paid this guy, you expected it to be good, but it's still hunting. Yep. yep. Like, you, you cannot no go out and just be like, hey this is going to happen. Like I paid this much money, so this has to happen. Now, with that said, when you told me last year that that antelope spot was a slam dunk, it was a slam dunk. (laughs) Well, it's a slam, it's as big of a slam dunk as you can (laughs) get within. (laughs) But I guess you can still, I guess you can still miss a slam dunk, but um, (laughs) like, I can't think of a guiding. Well, there's a couple, I guess when you go to Alaska or not Alaska, um, Africa, Mm Hmm. You're probably going to kill stuff. 100%. Like it, it just depends on what you want to kill. When I went on my um, Spanish-Hawaiian goat hunt in Hawaii, I knew I was going to kill gonna something. Kill yeah, like They're just everywhere. 
It's yep. just how, it, like, the only reason I wouldn't have, they were a 99.9% success rate. That point, that, that point one percent <laughs> they missed. Like, yeah, let's exactly. be honest. Like, they missed. So, but when you go on a deer or an elk or a mountain lion or any, like, a little bit tougher game, right? Like, right. for lack of better terms, more wild. Mm-hmm. Okay? You, you're going to get people that don't understand that it's still hunting. Like, yeah. they're still... I mean, these guys are not running around a bunch of private land where they know these lions are locked up. Like, they don't got them chained to a tree or anything. No. <laughs> like, they're, like you got to actually go out and you got to freaking work for them. And so I guess that's that's one thing I guess I appreciate is that there's... That you know that. Like, we're not, we're not here to, th- like you said, throw names under the bus or anything like that. Heck, it could have been a bad year. Who knows? Maybe this year they kill the biggest cat in the state. Yep. Like they Absolutely. very well could, or the most cats in the state, or you just, you don't know. Yep. And it it's just sometimes bad luck of when you go. I drew an elk tag, and I kid you not, all of September was 90 degrees at 8,000 feet. Mm-hmm. I went back in October. It was 80 degrees for rifle season. Like, Sometimes it's just bad luck. Like, a lot on the conditions. Yeah. So, and cool if you don't count. get those snow, exactly, where you can cut a track, cat hunting. Exactly. How do you know where to release the dogs? Exactly. Yeah. It's there's a lot of variables that come into play with that, and you know, you kind of made that comment here a couple minutes ago or a minute ago about you know that that particular outfitter in Wyoming. I know four guys personally, personally within 20 miles of us right now that had successful hunts with him. So, yeah, so it's not the guide. It was like, it's the, the wheels in my opinion had fallen off the wagon. There were some other things that had come into play on that deal that I won't get into, Yeah, but I mean, the guy is capable of, you know, completing a successful lion hunt, but for whatever the reasons were, um, it just it just didn't pan out. I guess I'm just going to settle on the fact that it just wasn't meant to be. You plus him was not a good combination. It was. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't. I've you know I've laid in bed a lot of nights and lost a lot of sleep over that deal. And I yeah. you know said, it just is what Nebraska it is. Nebraska guy, he ain't killing one. Yeah. yeah. Well, the other three like, did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just part of it. Uh, shoot. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. For sure. So. You got this cat treed. You found your angle. Yeah. So we were got you the, basically parallel with this cat on this shot? I guess we, I don't know this part. Pretty close. So that's really nice. I that's a huge advantage. I ranged him at like twelve yards or something like that, eleven or twelve yards. So I was able to work up that side hill, and I mean it. You like I said, you couldn't have put him in a better tree and had better placement um, for a shot opportunity and. Uh, yeah, the dogs were tied up. That's close. Like I'm just trying to think. Yeah, that, just looking that right table out. saw. Mm-hmm. It's probably about ten yards. Yep, just a fuzz beyond that, and within that video, that's how close you are to this cat. Yeah, looking. At, I mean, yeah, and it's crazy because he's you know 15 feet up in a tree. Yeah, but you're yeah basically 12 yards you're right all across. All but eye from, level with him. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, so it's cool. Um, had a great window. Uh, it's got senior and junior um they were obviously packing like i said um to begin this whole deal and they actually senior was running the cell phone he was running the camera angle and and junior had his handgun ready and in case and and they do it's nice they do talk through it with you and you know if things don't go as planned i mean because it's kind of an archery guy yeah Yeah. (laughs) so i mean prepare be prepared for things to go wrong i guess so to speak but you know they they do they do ask you, you know, are you okay if, you know, if we have to finish with the handgun, um, is that okay with you? And I'm not going to tell them no, right. but I mean, there's yeah. not, there ain't yeah. going to be any need. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, you know, I mean, I'm going to shoot it in the, I'm going to shoot it right away, right in the Boilermaker. Right exactly. The- exactly. And that was one of the cool things. So we, everybody got set up and, um, Yonzi was filming me from over the shoulder, which we did get some pretty cool footage of that. Yeah. And, um, and I, I X'd it, which was really neat. Um, that cat came down out of that tree and took every branch with it and just really good footage. And he was dead when he hit the bottom. 
you well, know, so he didn't take off. He didn't take a step. Never when he ran. Hit the ground. No. Never ran. He literally. We looked at the tracks on the way down, and he literally hit the ground and just slid the whole way down. Wow. Yeah, it was it was quite impressive. They'd never That's seen cool. one expire <laughs> quite that quick. So it was perfect yep. ending to a uh, you know to just an yep. incredible hunt. So that's awesome yeah but uh yeah it was then uh pictures kind of a little celebrating and and got him off the side of the mountain but i will tell you though the that that first encounter when you first see that lion in that tree it it will never in your life last long enough never yeah i could still be sitting under that tree today watching that lion and you know i i'd never have to shoot another one again um they are just such a, a beautiful animal and just what a bad predator, you know? And it, yeah, it's just, I, I could still sit there and just be watching him. You know, they're just such cool animals. So yeah, that's one, of, that's one of those moments that you, you have a really hard time of processing slash appreciating in the moment because 100%. there's so many things going on. Like I yep. just think about it. I've never been on a cat hunt, but I just think about it like deer hunting. Like when I kill a deer, like boom, I've shot my arrow. It's over. And it's like, dang, like thinking back to how that actually happened. Like, yep. it's like, wow, that was like really cool. Like watching him come, but you can't appreciate it when it's happening because there's so many other, there's like a million other things going through your mind. It is. Yeah. And when you're, you're the shooter, it definitely yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. You're not just a bystander or filming, whatever. Like you got a lot of things on your mind and yeah, you, it's almost one of those things you got to go back later and be and to appreciate it. That's I I pray that somebody I know books this hunt again so I can and I will gladly pay the fee is a you know an As extra add on yeah one yeah. thousand dollars by a, the way yeah I was it, looking on exactly. the website exactly thousand dollars gladly pay that one thousand dollars to go and just experience it as a spectator and not as a shooter because yeah. I do not that I. You know, I truly appreciate the experience I had, but I would, I would just love to experience it with somebody else and truly just take in that moment and yeah. not have to worry about making a shot or this or that, yeah. you know, just yeah. film it and enjoy it. Yeah. So, and that's awesome. someday hint, hint boys, hint, 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 hint. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I kind of got a big trip planned this fall, so I don't think my wife's going to be kosher with it this year. But <laughs> yeah. we'll have to talk about it for future years. <laughs> I think I have enough dollars tied up already this year that uh, it's probably a no-go for me. Now, Eric, on the other hand, Eric makes, like, buku dollars. Like, he's got this bushy job where he just sits and doesn't do much at an office desk and just makes, like, <laughs> thousands and hundreds of yeah. thousands of dollars. Eat. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> yeah. So he's just well, got... be booked right now. If that, was the case. <laughs> if that was the case, yeah. No. It's only money. You can't take it's it with money. you. It's just money. You can't take it. You, you know, it's, <laughs> so my dad always told me, and, I mean, my dad's the guy that he... He's a big walleye fisherman, so he trades boats every two to three years. Like, he mm-hmm. gets a new boat, trades his boat in. But he has always told my brother and I, and I used to think he was joking, but now I'm pretty sure he's serious. But he'd say, just so you guys know, if I leave you any money, it's due to bad planning. <laughs> like, I was hey, like, I, I can't, can't disagree with him I, there. <laughs> I always used to think it was a joke, but, but now the way I see him in retirement, I'm like, no, and no, he's serious. Like yeah. he's really not leaving us anything. <laughs> like, he's spending your inheritance, <laughs> right? It's a it's a good thing I found a decent career. My wife's got a good career, and and uh, we we can go that route because I don't I don't think my dad's leaving me anything. <laughs> I'm pretty confident of it. I mean, I guess I get his guns and stuff, but never a bad investment. No, that's not. That's true. That's true. That's true. So. Well, you so you, this cat's at the taxidermist. It is. Yep, it's uh, at O'Hare Taxidermy down in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, Brandon O'Hare has it. He's uh, he does a phenomenal job with cats. He's got a couple of my bobcats to do life size, and um, yeah, cat taxidermist. It's one one of them things. Definitely shop around, and I don't mean price wise. Uh, find a guy that's right for the job. Cats are super hard, and you know, it's 
it's not easy to, you know, there's a lot of tax firms out there, but not a lot of them that can do a great cat. And, well, but he's one of them. I'm confident in and, his abilities. So. And for you, like, it's something that, like, it's not where, like, you shoot a big mule deer next year. You're going to shoot another one in your lifetime. It's a good chance. I hope. You might yeah. not shoot another cat. You know, it. I mean, you might. Probably not. You might. It's unlikely. But odds yep. are that you're not going to. And if you did, it wouldn't mean as much as this one did right yeah. now. So, so, yeah. so you want to make sure 100%. you have a good taxidermist. You want to make sure you have have those things in line. Um, Absolutely. And there are guys that tax, taxidermists, there's, they're, they, they can specialize a little bit. Like they can be really good at a cat and not quite as good as a whitetail. They mm-hmm. might be really good with a mule deer, but maybe they struggle a little bit with, you know, that's with what I've fish seen a lot or, around you know, yeah. here. Yeah, they a lot of our guys around here are great with game heads. But when you and cats are just hard. I mean, you gotta wanna be good at cats. You gotta obviously kind of specialize in them. And yeah. that's kind of the cool thing about Brandon is he I don't know if he'd come out and actually say it, but he I know he would say he specializes in cats and canines and to look at his work, I mean, it's it's no doubt. I mean, yeah. he's he's got That's a cool. he's got an eye for it, and he's talented with it. So, yep. yep. But awesome. yeah, so looking forward to getting that piece back here. So okay. no doubt. Awesome. So just a reminder for everybody that was Canyon Rim Outfitters, and what was it was what what was their names? Scott Senior and Scott Junior. Scott um, Senior. Um, Summer is their last name. Okay. Father yeah. son. Yep. duo type thing and, and they are a hoot to hunt with you will not be disappointed yeah. just good guys good sense of humor um just go getters man i mean it's which sounds like it's a very important thing in in a hunt like this so they yeah they they want you to truly be successful is this I one mean, of them right here yep that's junior right that's there. junior that's what yep. i figured okay. and funny story at dinner i mean because see we were talking about that blizzard we had so we killed that lion on a Wednesday. We didn't get it come home till Sunday because oh, the that's interstates right. and the roads yeah. were all yeah. closed. So, so we killed, you know, four days in, um, in rifle and silk Colorado and dang near, you know, hung out with these guys every day yeah. while we were there in the hotel and went out to dinner with them and just, just good, good people truly. So yeah, if, if you're in the market for a lion hunt, I, I would truly look no further and I'll be honest. I mean, I'm sure they're not the least expensive, um, but they uh, take it from me and in my story, it's it's worth a little bit of extra money, you know, hundred percent. And they're a good time. You're gonna you're gonna enjoy it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, guys, oh, gotta reach for my phone here. Did you finish your beers? Pretty much. One hour. Is exactly. That <laughs> That's long. That's longer than I thought. Jeez, you got you're long winded there, Gary. Sorry. <laughs> Hopefully everybody got the full, no, full I think, experience. I think that's sweet. I think that's I'm actually just sitting here listening. I've I, heard most of the story. I, yeah, so there's just, a lot of details. That's a lot I, of small details. I had already heard most of that story, but I think it's great for people to hear because like I said, I think there you're probably talking ninety five you're you could probably say ninety seven percent of people of hunters maybe even 97 plus that may never go on that hunt may never experience that. Like that is not a common thing when you look in the world or the, of how many hunters we actually have in the U S of how many people actually have the opportunity or choose to, however you want to look at it, go on a mountain lion hunt. Um, it's a very, very small percentage of people. And so I think it's a really cool story that, that a lot of people, um, wouldn't know much about if they hadn't heard it or wouldn't have thought about it. Um, and maybe that can help expose them to something. Yeah. I feel like it's very judged. Yeah. An adventure. (laughs) It, oh yeah. Without a doubt. I've got that from a few people, you know, it's, but it's that saying, you don't knock it till you try it. Yeah. If you're judging it, then I guarantee you, you have not tried it. Yeah. I can promise you it will be one of the toughest yeah. hunts you ever do in your life. Yeah. And when you're, when it's all said and done, I mean, just the overall respect I have for those two guys and those dogs and those animals. I mean, I goosebumps right now. Yeah. I mean, it is just, 
an incredible experience. So don't say there's no sport in it. Don't say it's not hard because I can promise yeah. you, you'd better get in shape. And I can yeah. promise you it is anything but easy. You yeah. know, it's like I said, it's you're chasing the baddest, one of the baddest predators in, yeah. in North America. Yeah. In the, some of the baddest country in the worst weather. I mean, yeah. it's, yeah, you better, better be ready to work yeah. when you go, you know, yeah. and some of them can be easy and some of them are, and they're hard, but that's it's, awesome. it's a true experience. So that's all I can say to any, any haters, I guess, is, yeah. you know, don't knock it till you try it because it's, it is truly the experience of a yeah. lifetime. That's so. awesome. Well, on that note, I think we'll close her out. It's now two and a half hours past my bedtime. <laughs> So I got to go to bed. We appreciate all of you listening and watching. Um, those of you watching on YouTube, you already know about it there. But make sure you find us on that, uh, any podcast platform that you use. Uh, that's Hunting Overtime Podcast. Uh, those of you listening to us on the podcast, make sure you find us on the Seasons Media website at theseasonsmedia.com. Find us at the Seasons Media on YouTube. And look, look for some of the the content that these two guys are providing for us this year. I I think it's going to be a fantastic year. I'm really excited to have you guys on board with the seasons media. Um, I think it could be a really fun fall and I think it's time to make this thing kind of blow up and see where it goes for us all. So I'm excited to have you guys on board. I appreciate it all. And we appreciate all the listeners and viewers who are watching and listening to this. I don't know what else to say. It's 11.30. I just finished my wife's White Claw. It's time to go to, it's time to, go to bed. Good way to end the night. That's how we end the night. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, we'll catch you on the next episode.